Today on The Grave Talks, Civil War Ghosts of Georgia, a conversation with author Courtney McInvale. Courtney McInvale's life is an interesting story. She was born and raised in Connecticut, yet her father was from Georgia and very proud of his Southern roots. She's the founder of Seaside Shadows Haunted History Tours. She interned at NCIS in the Cold Case Homicide Unit. She was an FBI analyst and went on to work for the Department of Homeland Security. She is also a spirit medium who can communicate with the other side. Maybe that all started with the paranormal activity in her childhood home. In fact, it was so extreme when she was a teenager that the Warren family investigated and cleansed her house. Those skills and experiences all come together for her books. Her latest book, Civil War Ghosts of Georgia, Volume 1, takes us to the battlefields and to the spirits that yearn to have their stories told. If you love history and you love ghost stories, this book is for you. Today on The Grave Talks, The Civil War Ghosts of Georgia, a conversation with author Courtney McInvale. I was telling you before I hit record that you have one of the most impressive bios I've ever read. I feel like my bio is so unworthy compared to yours. But no, oh thank you so much. It could be just that I'm very verbose and I feel like different parts should be highlighted. So don't so don't worry, but thank you. Well let me just hit the highlight real real quick because you are the founder of Seaside Shadows Haunted History Tours. Now yeah. where do you do those tours? So right now we're based out of Mystic, Connecticut. That's where we started uh, 10 years ago. We recently expanded into a neighboring community, Westerly, Rhode Island, and we're researching new communities now. Now, you do have a book about Mystic, Haunted Mystic, and I've heard that city is very haunted. Is that true? Yeah. You know, I think it's funny because... Connecticut and New Englanders in general, we can sometimes be tight-lipped about our hauntings. So a lot of the stories that were there were sort of swept under the rug, but there were plentiful stories and it was really fun to sort of extract all those out of history. And then also in your bio, you worked for the FBI as an analyst. That sounds impressive. (laughs) That (laughs) That sounds intimidating to me. No, no. So what happened was is in college, I went to school in Washington, D.C. So I was a small town girl in the big city and I loved it. And um, I had the opportunity to intern for the Naval Criminal Investigative Service, NCIS. A lot of people know it as because there was a fictional TV show about it. Um, And they were right at the Washington Navy Yard. And I got to intern there for a year um, and a great part of that year doing cold case homicide. And I loved it. So at the end of that internship, when I graduated college, it was in 08. So I was graduating into a recession. Um, You know, I was looking for a job and NCIS didn't have a lot of available positions or really any And FBI was having a hiring blitz. And I thought, you know, it's got to be commensurate. So I applied for that um, and got in and went to the FBI Academy and then got placed as a counterterrorism analyst. (laughs) Like, seriously, there could be a a TV show just about you. Because (laughs) because then on top of that. Normal for D.C. (laughs) students at the time. it was. (laughs) So on top of that, you are a spirit medium. Yeah, yeah. And that's kind of a funny title for me because I feel like a lot of folks think that's very like frou-frou and like Long Island medium or something like that. But for me, I just always grew up, you know, experiencing spiritual things and having this intuitive side. And I sort of let that guide me in my work and and what I do. Do you think that growing up in a house with a lot of activity kind of open that door for you to become sensitive to that? 
I think it definitely played a role. You know, I spent a lot of time sort of researching as well where spiritual intuition or gifts or things like that may come from. And a lot of folks do think it's, you know, in your ancestry and can be passed down. And I think that's partially true, but it's not all bloodline, right? Like your your ancestors sort of teach the next generation. And I have a lot of Irish and Scottish ancestry and, you know, found some interesting connections there. But growing up in a house with a lot of activity, you're sort of almost always sort of straddling worlds maybe. Mm -hmm. Um, And then when, uh, you know, this might be flash forwarding a bit too much, but when Lorraine Warren ended up coming to my house to investigate and her being a psychic, she did sort of tell our family that because of our experiences, we would always have a heightened sensitivity to spirit activity for the rest of our lives. What brought her to your house? Was it just, we can't take this anymore? Um, we we <laughs> yeah, need somebody so to get in here and help us? Bag of things. You know, my family lived in that house for 18 years. Um, so I feel like a lot of times we're so used to Amityville stories and people running in and running out. And it wasn't really like that. It was more of a slow, spooky burn, I guess. Um, like it started off just normal old New England house, right? Flickering lights, a creaky door. Maybe you hear footsteps in a room where no one is. And we all kind of knew that old houses did strange things. My mother taught us that. No one really lost sleep about it or worried. Um, But as we got older, there were a lot of things that happened in our family life. And my dad, who had been a police officer, started his own company uh, to make more money called Postmortem Cleanup. Uh, and around the time that he was doing this sort of dirty work of cleaning up death scenes, he also was suffering from his own depressive disorders, and that was causing a rift in the family and ended up to my parents separating. So, of course, it's around the time where I call people the per- tell people it's the perfect storm, mm-hmm. where mm-hmm. all these emotional events and things that are, you know, close to death type things start happening then the activity in our house changed and we started to have what appeared to be malevolent things in the house. There were strange blood marks on some of the wallpaper. There were strange smells. There were, you know, shadowy figures. And my poor mother, very Irish Catholic raised, so we're all inherently superstitious. She was calling the priest, you know, to come in. She she was very worried. And um, then she called the pastor when the priest got a little bit spooked, but the pastor ended up blaming my grateful dead posters and then ultimately um <laughs> sorry was right? i wasn't ready for that <laughs> oh i know no one is i wasn't when it happened it's like they're just um, grateful dead posters yeah he said they were summoning in demons um you know sorry jerry garcia hasn't done that to my knowledge but um then you know eventually my mom heard you know this is kind of i tell people in the age of yield dial up internet she heard about um, and Lorraine Warren, and they resided in Connecticut, which is where we resided. They too were Catholic, like our family. And um, this was before all the Hollywood movies really bolstered them. So they were still sort of in business. And that's uh, when she gave them a ring and asked them to come out. So they did. And what was that like? Did you leave the house when they were there? Did you we kids did for stick a couple around? nights. You know, we lived in a small town and my mom was a teacher and my dad, again, had been a police officer. So being public servants in the local communities, we didn't advertise that we had ghost hunters there right. or where we were absent. Uh, so my mom told the school we were on vacation and we spent a couple nights at a local hotel while the Warren you know, team was in our house and uh, orchestrating a cleansing. Did it work when you went back? Was the was it better? You know, I felt it was. It's hard to say. You know, is it mind over matter? Is right. it belief? Did they do something? Lorraine was incredibly gracious to our family. She was really at the helm because Ed was sick at that time. And she, you know, she developed a, a close relationship with my mom at that time communicating and, and, and maybe the two of them together had this sort of power that helped the house. Um, because I, I didn't have any other issues. No one did after that, but 
Lorraine did sort of caution my mom that if there were big changes, people moving out, the house would sell, that some of the activity could resume itself. And, you know, when I went off to college, some activity resumed when my next sister started preparing to go off to college some activity resumed. And so it was around that time when when my second, you know, the middle sister was in late high school that my mom called me. I was at a study abroad in Ireland and she said, you know, I'm selling the house. And um, she did. And. And then what I'm told is, you know, ever since a lot of families have had haunting activity that's very similar to what we had. However, it was so funny. It was just a few weeks ago I was giving a talk about just this story. And the woman who just bought my childhood home uh, came to the, the program. She had just moved in a few months ago. And she said that it's been really nice and no issues. So fingers crossed. That's funny that she was there. So did she know your backstory and that you had lived in the house? Or- I think so. I have different programs that I sometimes give. And this library was a couple towns away from the town I grew up in. And they asked if I would talk about, you know, the hauntings growing up and the Warrens coming. And so I have one of those programs that I'll do, you know, I'm more of a history nerd. So I try to push my history programs more. But, you know, I understand around Halloween time, people like, you know, the, the haunted Warren uh, come into your house story. So they advertised that I was coming, that I'd grown up in East Hampton. And East Hampton's a very small town that I grew up in. So word got around and I think made it to her that, hey, this girl that grew up in the house you bought is going to be talking. And so she came out. I think that's interesting to hear her act like there's not much going on there. Yeah, you know, and I, I don't know that she's, I don't think she's lying. I think I tell, and I told her the same thing Uh, there. If we look at haunted house histories, you'll find that a lot of the big haunted houses have residents who don't have any experiences there. And that's why I tell people in my programs You can't blame a house or a property, really, for an extreme haunting. It can happen anywhere. And and I am of the belief that a lot of our haunting, you know, really escalated or became noticeable because of things that were going on in our personal and our family lives and in my dad's job and, and those things that were happening then more so than it was the property. Looking back on it now, do you think that your dad, you know, starting up that new business where he, and that's a very important business, but that would be a very difficult thing to do, especially when you're dealing with some mental health issues, maybe. Do you think he could have, you know, between his own mental health and having that kind of a new business, do you think maybe he could have brought something home with him? I do. I think energy is very powerful. And we all carry our own energy with us. And when we struggle in our lives or have ailments or, you know, our mind starts to go into these dark places, a dark energy can sort of surround us. And my dad, I think, had a dark energy that was sort of permeating from things that he was dealing with. And I think dark energies find each other Mm -hmm. and they perpetuate. And I think, you know, maybe when he was out there and trying to do his thing and going through what he was, a dark energy could have, you know, saddled itself with him and thought, we're just gonna, you know, snowball this. And, um, you know, the older I get, the more I think that that's probably more likely what happened. And, and Lorraine Warren kind of said the same thing that these, these energies kind of look for almost these weaknesses in people. Yeah. I think that that could have happened. But one thing your dad did do, because he was a history major, in college. And so he kind of instilled a love of history into you. And I was reading in your bio, let me pull it up. I don't have my glasses on, but it, that he had you uh, memorize the names of civil war generals by photograph before you turned seven. (laughs) Yeah. Other kids are doing their math flashcards. You're doing your civil war general flashcards. That's right. That's right. He, um, He was a very proud Southerner, um, and he had met my mom from Connecticut, and they raised us in Connecticut, but he wanted to make sure I knew my Southern history, and so uh, he would really 
sort of go ham on Civil War history with me when I was little. And I learned to play chess on a Civil War chess set. And I had the generals memorized. Oh, yeah. I mean, he was kind of a nerd about history. Like when I had an exam in school and your parents had to sign it, if it was a history exam, he would look at the content and sign it to whatever pertinent person that you know the test related to and I used to be so humiliated right <laughs> but now I look back and I know it's just you know really funny and he just really loved the material now you first wrote a book about the revolutionary war ghosts of Connecticut yes. so that yes. have you always been interested in these American wars is that something you know, that I you've just been interested in forever I mean, I, I think part of it comes, of course, from my childhood, and I always enjoyed history more than any other subject, um, you know, and, and always sort of tried to hone my studies in that direction. And, you know, when I was writing, I wanted to do a Civil War book because of everything that I had learned in my childhood. And my my publisher at that time that I was working with said, you know, you don't really have Civil War stuff up there, you know, try the Revolutionary War. And I, you know, I was hesitant, but I got really into it and interested and loved the story of America's founding and these patriots and sort of some people call it America's first Civil War um, because it was all these settlers fighting each other. And I just got so intrigued by everyone from Nathan Hale to Benedict Arnold. I got, you know, really enthralled in that. And from there on, I knew that I just wanted to keep, you know, America in wartime. It, it, I was interested in battlefields, brother against brother, this this energy that sort of palpated from these big events where we were trying to make something and we were killing each other for it. Um, you know, that to me left behind an energy that's just undeniable. And I so agree with you. I've been to a few battlefields and to me, it's it's so interesting because when you think of a battlefield, you just think of the national parks, the ones that have been turned into it, like a park. Yes. And so you can yes. see these rolling hills and then you imagine what happened there. But the thing is, is reading your book, The Civil War Ghosts of Georgia, and this is volume one, there will be another one. Yes. It's interesting to me because that's not all battlefields. You know, battlefields happen a lot of different places. And so there could be homes built on battlefields. There could be oh, yeah. housing developments built on battlefields. Yes. And there are. Yes. There are. They they estimate, and in the American Civil War alone, which was just a period of four years, right, in the early 1860s, that there were over 10,000 battles or skirmishes or engagements. 10, and when we think thousand. of parks, we think of, you know, the very major engagements, of course. But that means that all these other little engagements are, you know, are somewhere <laughs> and they're on someone's property. Because I, in our other podcast, we have one that we just share real ghost stories. It's real ghost stories online. And we get so many stories of people saying, you know, we built this house and it's a new build. You know, we're the first people to live in it. So obviously there can't be a ghost here but we're having these things happen in the house. Yeah. And I'm like, but yeah. you don't know what happened there. And you don't, and again, you don't know, the, that's right. You don't know the history of the property. You don't know the history of all your items or things you've inherited. And you don't know if there's anything personal that could be correlating with it. There's, you know, when people have haunted activity, it's such a mix of reasons that could lead for it to happen. It's just so interesting because there is an example in the book that you talk about. Um, I can't remember off. I did jot a note down about, um, uh, oh, Kolb's farm, that after there was a skirmish, a fight there, a battle there, and then it became a housing development, Colbridge Court, yes. and several residents had seen Civil War soldiers walk through the homes. Yes. Which yes. makes sense. That makes sense to it me. It does. It You're does. on their and, land. And it's funny, that's up near um that's up near Kennesaw Mountain. And uh when you visit Kennesaw Mountain, it's really a suburb of Atlanta right now. So you're driving through residence, 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 and then boom, here's a segment of battlefield and a visitor center, and then there's more residents. And 
I was looking all over. I like to find the old sites of headquarters and things like that, or offices where decisions were made, where the men were meeting. And of course, Sherman is sort of the the Voldemort of Georgia. General <laughs> Sherman is. I guess I would call him. And <laughs> That's very true. Head, he had a headquarters at Kennesaw Mountain, and I'm looking all over, right? And my cousins are with me, and we're we're walking the streets and we're now in this residential community and we're looking at these maps and we're talking to people and we just saw that it was just where this person's house we saw teddy bears on the outside just a normal old house was right where sherman's headquarters would have been you know just feet away from from where the battlefield would have been and it was just such a strange thing to see it that way you know like not all battlefields are that built upon but that one notably was (laughs) And this book is really interesting because you take a deep dive into some of these battles. Yes. So because of your father's connection to Georgia, you kind of spotlight the um, soldiers from Georgia. Yes. In those battles. You take a deep dive into these battles. How did you even start that research? Oh, my gosh. Because it's impressive. (laughs) <laughs> it's I love research and um you know probably my time working for the government helped me with that is putting together puzzle pieces finding details um and you know and that's what I love and so I had I had talked about you know Connecticut ghosts before and I had written about civil war soldiers from Connecticut and I firmly felt because even though we didn't have battles up here that spiritual stories, haunting stories are the stories of people. So I started off in that book really just sort of, that's more of like my, I guess, novice getting my feet wet. But I started traveling the battlefields, talking to park rangers, interviewing residents, and most of all, going to primary sources, finding newspapers, books, journals, letters, and finding as many as I could in just immersing myself in their stories, in their words, from their perspective, and really trying to get an idea of what war was like for them, what they saw, what they experienced. And then I would match those with the battle lines and flanking maneuvers so that I could see and stand where they stood and be like, okay, this is what they were describing. This is what they experienced. This is what they felt. And, you know, my husband was pretty good at explaining battle lines if I didn't understand which was direction was coming from where or why. So he was helpful to bring around to and just flat out just spending time everywhere I could that they were was the most helpful thing. How long did it take you to research this? Oh, my gosh. It's I've been researching this now for probably a few years, okay. um, just really going to town on the Civil War history. So, you know, it, a few years and, you know, the Connecticut book, like I said, my novice when I took about a year and a half and then I took almost two more years to get the Georgia material, um, which was so, so dense because you know, two years into the war, battles started happening in Georgia while men from Georgia were fighting outside of Georgia. So there was just so many layers there to really get through, you know, and I still have my uh, bucket list of battlefields that I haven't gone to, but I try to get to as many as I can. And when you think about this particular war, um, you know, these weren't well-equipped soldiers. They didn't have what we have today, you know, they barely even had shoes and coats and food. (laughs) Yeah. The Texans had no shoes. Um, you, you'll hear a lot about how they marched barefoot, um, everywhere. Um, the Confederate army compared to the union army definitely had far less resources. Um, you know, because the U S army is funded by the federal government. There's more of them. Um, you know, the Confederate army, they are the rebels, right? And so there are a lot of people that are coming from their farms and homes, young boys, just with whatever they own on their backs and, you know, not getting uniforms, even the generals sometimes for months or longer. Um, So they really are not prepared. And on the union side, they're not prepared in the sense that those boys aren't out hunting like the the rebel boys Mm. are. They're getting prepared to go to university. So they're being handed rifles 
the day before a battle and, you know, good luck to you. I hope you know how to use it and figure it out. So it's, it's tragic on all ends. And just what happened on the land. And I've always thought this about any battlefield. When you think about what happened there, once that battle's over, years have passed, how can that energy just go away? You know, how can what that trauma and that, because there's, with a, with a war, there's so much unfinished business with everybody involved. Nobody, you know, everybody's got loved ones at home they want to say goodbye to. There's just, it's just tragic in so many ways. It is, it is. And I, you know, I, I have investigated on a lot of battlefields with my own equipment and, and my own things and intuition. And a lot of what we've gathered is people calling out for their family members or calling out for help. Um, you know, or talking about the last thing they said or, and, you know, things like that or what they remember. But you also get at battlefields a lot of sounds of phantom, you know, gunfire, uh, cannon fire. You get sounds of, you know, drumming. We just got, you know, when we went to Gettysburg recently, we could hear drumming coming from the woods, um, all sorts of things like that, which is more residual, um, you know, and I tell folks, I, I don't know the answer to this, but I have two theories. One being that maybe when big events happen somewhere, it creates this sort of slip in time, um, almost where we get this little glimpse back in time when we go there, you know, that we're bridging this, this world between times because, you know, we think time's linear, but it's not. Or, the energy has remained or both. I talked to a park ranger at a place called Pickett's Mill and, you know, we were talking about hauntings and he said he used to be a paranormal investigator. And then he sort of stopped that after he had his own near death experience. And um, he said, it's because he felt that everything was more energy focused. And he said, Courtney, think about it. If you have all this fear and all this pain and all this death, and you and these people are exerting that energy of fear and pain where they are, even if they leave or their bodies leave, where does that energy mm -hmm. go? Mm -hmm. Right. And I thought, yeah, that probably does explain why when you get to these places, you still feel that pain and fear. It doesn't always mean that there's an active spirit with unfinished business. Of course, I'm sure it could. But maybe you're just picking up on all of that collective energy as well. I totally agree with that. And I, and I think for someone like you who has that ability to connect, it would seem to me researching this book, going to those battlefields, experiencing that, that had to have been a really emotional slash draining <laughs> slash overwhelming <laughs> experience for you. It is. I, um, you know, sometimes I'll just sit there, you know, in the field and I'll probably look like, you know, the resident Looney Tune at the time, but I'll just sit there in the field and just sort of try to take it all in and listen and feel. And I always sort of say, and, and you know, this may sound crazy, but if any of them do hear me, I'm like, I'm just here to share your story. I'm here to help you. And I always say, whether I'm at a graveyard or a battlefield, you are remembered and you are loved because I don't know that they can hear that, but I think that they need to hear that. And I think that we all need that to know that one day when we go, we are remembered and we are loved. So that's sort of my goal when I'm there is to sort of bring them any peace I can if I'm able to. I think more people who visit Battlefield should put that out there. Honestly, I do. Because I think that <laughs> yeah, would be wonderful. They come there to be scared, right? Or yeah. They come there for, for ill, not ill reasons, but thrill seeking. And sometimes that gives those of us who are genuinely interested in the human, you know, stories here, a bad name because people think we're all like that, just looking to get a ghost to come out. And, and that's not how I feel when I'm there at all. And don't you think too, I mean, ideally, when we all pass, the one thing that you want, or I think anyway, is that you should be surrounded by love. 
And yes. that would be the way to pass from this world to whatever's next. None of these people got that. You and know, they really it's... didn't expect it. You know, when when these boys and young men left home, this was going to be a short war. This was going to be quick. They were going to go home. Both sides felt this way for their own reasons. They didn't think years in they'd be watching friends die. There, I mean, there's this haunting area of Northern Virginia Chancellorsville, Spotsylvania, Wilderness. It's all in this same geographic region. And three battles took place there, one in 1863 and, and two in 1864. Um, and when the boys that were there in 1863 at Chancellorsville march in for the wilderness in 1864, they talk about how they're stepping over the remains of their friends from the year before. And that, to me, is one of the most haunting things I've ever read. In the book you mentioned, too, something I had never thought about was they would hire people. There was a slave or a former slave. I don't know if he was a slave at the yes, time. Yes, Mark Thrash. Yes. yes. Mm -hmm. That he went in to look for somebody. And that was common. You know, a woman might go looking for her husband or Absolutely. he would go yeah. looking for somebody's son. I found that fascinating. I never thought about that before. But, you oh, know, and yeah. I think it, the union side tried to do a better job of taking their men back or, or, or properly burying well, them. You know, actually, that to me is one of the most fascinating stories of all. Um, you know, w war widows went out from both sides as much as they could um, to try to find their husbands. Some went, some wives just flat out went to war with their husbands. They're like, I'm coming, you know, and, and I appreciate those women. I'm like, that would have been me. Like I'm coming, you know, but, um, what happened with the burials is really interesting. Um, you know, the union did try to bring some of their dead home as much as they could, but they didn't bring the Confederates because you know, they were the rebels. They were, you know, they were the enemy. They were trying to not keep America together, right? So the women of the South were very upset by this. And, you know, these are their husbands, brothers, sons. Mm -hmm. And so there was a group of women led by Mary Green and others, and they formed, you know, associations where they, the ladies of the South, went out to these battlefields months after the war sometimes even longer they raised funds from their neighbors and they gathered these bodies and they brought them home and they created cemeteries for them and they started something called dedication day um and they started this in virginia and georgia the dates were a little bit different um some of them tried to start it around the anniversary of stonewall jackson's death and they had a full you know cemetery built for these men and they started that dedication day, which the union noticed and said, maybe we should have a Memorial Day. And they started Memorial Day from that tradition that the ladies of the South started bringing home their dead. Wow. Isn't that something that the women, <laughs> right. the women went exactly. and got him? Yes. And if you go to um, Marietta, Georgia, which is, again, a suburb of Atlanta, um, You'll see outside the Marietta Confederate Cemetery next to the Marietta City Cemetery. They're kind of managed together now. There is a beautiful statue of three of the women who started this movement. And that wraps up part one of our conversation about the Civil War Ghosts of Georgia with author Courtney McInvale. You can get the book on Amazon or wherever books are sold. You can also get more information about Courtney at her website, Courtney McInvale, M C I N V A L E dot com. If you'd like access to all of our episodes, including the archive and advanced episodes, everything commercial free, you can become a gravekeeper. You can sign up on Apple Podcasts where you can try it for three days free, or you could go to patreon.com slash the Grave Talks. I'm Carol Hughes, and for all of us here at the Grave Talks, thank you for listening. <laughs>